Thank you very much for joining. I wanted to, to start out, Rabbi, by having hearing a little bit about your background, what initiated the, your passion and uh, power into becoming a rabbi, writing this, the, this book, um, Doesn't Anybody Blush Anymore, that you know, it's been, what, 30 years now since it came out, and uh, reading it as a 24-year-old, I feel like it's more, um, even more, um, apparent and necessary than, than perhaps when you first wrote it. And, um, and we'll transition from there really into um, the topic of the book um, and other videos that I love and enjoy watching uh, on YouTube. But uh, please, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Well, uh, being a student of Chabad, having gone to Chabad yeshivas, uh, naturally, as soon as I was finished with yeshiva and as soon as I got married, I was looking for a shlichut to go to a community and offer my services and see what I can do to enhance Jewish life. And I ended up in Minnesota, Twin Cities, Minnesota. This is 1970. One of the programs we started here is Beit Chana, a program for women, like a little crash course on Judaism. For, for adult women, college age and higher, uh, who, who were not raised with it, who didn't have a Jewish education, but they wanna do a little catch up. Well, it, it took off like crazy. We never expected it to become what it became. International, 100 women for each program, which is maximum, or more than what, what the Chabad house could handle. And it's been going on ever since. Only now, we also have a program for teenagers and for single mothers and all sorts of specialized programs. So teaching women for 20 years, it's not surprising that uh, all of that information would eventually be put into a book. So 20 years after we started, 1990, uh, the first my first book was published by Harper San Francisco, a book on modesty. I gotta tell you how that happened. I was in California, in Marin County, Northern California. And I was speaking about modesty. In the audience, there was a vice president of the publishing house of Harper, San Francisco. He comes over to me after the speech and he says, do you know that Marin County is the hot tub capital of America? Mm -hmm. If you can speak about modesty in this community, you should be writing a book and we'll publish it. So that's how it happened. So it's basically a book about relationships, primarily marriage, and it's focusing on, as you, as you read, as you saw, mm -hmm. it focuses on the importance of borders. Yeah. That everything in nature has its natural borders. Marriage has its natural borders that makes it different from every other relationship. If you don't respect those borders, your marriage becomes something other than marriage. It becomes a roommate, yeah. a sibling, a war zone. I don't know, it becomes something yeah. else. No, it's, it's funny. I was listening to um, a couple of previous interviews been on, you've been on, even back when the book first came out. And you know, the, <laughs> the woman that was interviewing you, I don't know her name, it was called like Portrait or something as a show. And it was just hilarious because she was like, it was like she was interrogating you. 
she was like, please just, just tell more. Or I really would like to, to give you a handshake. Not, nothing wrong with it, of course. But when you were given like an analogy, it was kind of funny uh, in a listener point of view of how she would like, but you're going straight to the bedroom and, and not a, um, we're just talking about shaking hands here. But the, I found the analogy very uh, actually appropriate if you listen to it fully. Um, but well, in what happened uh, there when we first met, yeah, when I came to the studio, she extended her hand, and I said, oh, we, we don't shake hands. <laughs> she never got over that but for the rest of the hour. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Oh, he doesn't shake. <laughs> Um, on the topic of relationships, since w th there's plenty of questions I'd love to ask more about, you know, your development and getting more into the Chabad. And I, I also listened to an interview where you shared that starting the, the Be um, Beit Chana was actually a, uh, a joke of sorts. But in, when it comes to relationships, and it seems not just in, um, you know, um, sexual relationships or partnerships, um, seem, things seem to be much, well, just in general, not just in relationships, but everything nowadays seems to be much more open, transparent. So how, how does one really cultivate these, these borders? How do you define um, the borders, you know, in this relationships topic that we're focused on but also it applies kind of everywhere. Well, let, let's make a distinction between open, mm -hmm. or as you call it, transparent, versus shallow. A relationship can't afford to be shallow. And there are different degrees of depth or profundity. A marriage has to be deep or it's not a marriage at all yeah so it can't be transparent it has to be internal internal is not visible so what you show on the outside is just the tip of the iceberg it's the real meat of the relationship is under the surface where it can't be seen and shouldn't be seen that's called modesty. So how come? I feel like I'm not against that at all, but I'm curious because it, different leaders that I may look out, look out, uh, listen to, or aspire some aspect that I appreciate about them, they openly share things about, uh, you know, their sex life or other kind of things that. How, how would you, I guess just to transition, let's, let's talk, talk a little bit more about modesty. How come some of those things should be um, kept just between the, the husband and wife? Because the, in, but because the external is a reflection of the internal. So it's almost like if, if you come across a relationship, it's almost like you can tell just by observing a little bit of how they interact with each other, what it's like internally. Without them telling you. Yeah, ex precisely. Yeah. Just, just by I'm reading saying. body language. Right. And that's what I mean by tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Okay. You can tell from body language and other behavioral things what's going on on the inside. Mm -hmm. You don't see the inside. That's private. So let's talk about it from this from this perspective. Everybody knows that people who don't wear clothes, nudist colonies, there's very little intimacy going on. There's very little sex going on. And what is the explanation? So some people say, well, you know, they got so inured, they got so jaded, and uh, it's available all the time, you kind of lose interest. 
But that's not the whole story. The whole story is really this. There is a kind of energy that is sensual. There are different kinds of energy. And they have different they have different locations in the body. Mm -hmm. And they serve different purposes. The energy that is sensual or sexual is an internal energy. Now, that energy is, is limited. You have only so much of it because we're finite human beings. If that energy is dissipated, if you kind of waste it all day long, and then you come home at night and you want to be intimate, and you just don't have any more energy. Nudity is not transparent. It's it's a um, it's a waste of sexual energy because you're broadcasting sexual energy all the time in an impersonal way, not directed at anyone in particular. Interesting. So it's like light diffusing. The further you get from the light, the less light there is because it's spread wide, diffused. Yeah. Diffuse your energy by exposing the intimate parts of your body. So when Adam and Chava realized that they were naked, and they were ashamed, they weren't ashamed of the evil or ugliness of sexuality. They were in the Garden of Eden. There was no ugliness there. Yeah. And there was no, set, no sin. They were ashamed of the fact that they didn't protect and preserve their sexual energy. So they went and they got dressed to preserve the sexual energy. Interesting. That's what modesty means. Modesty is not an attempt to curtail sexual activity. The purpose is... Enhance, enhances it. Yes, to, to preserve it for when you need it. So that's when, when I was, what really um, caught my attention or pulled me in a lot more in the book is this idea that it's a folk modesty is a focused surrender. And like you brought up uh, with the, the Rebbe sharing a story of when the doctor was putting a hypodermic needle and he was saying the hypodermic needle needle creates not merely an empty space, but a designed vacuum drawing in only what was meant to be drawn in. It's very emptiness is focused. So in the, and the topic of modesty and what I also really appreciated about the, the verbiage, the word, the word uh, choice and your articulation is the very specific way of channeling what you, what you mean, because a lot of it can also be very general. How does one take an honest look and create those borders and make sure that they're not boundaries? Ah. <laughs> yeah. How do you remain sexually healthy and not obsessive or, or disturbed? <laughs> you see, and there's a very thin line. Yeah. It so easily goes from healthy to, to, to uh, destructive. Yeah. And that's why there are so many issues in marriage that need to be dealt with, that need to be clarified. But it starts at a very young age. What is it about a little girl, six or seven years old, who suddenly wants her privacy? It's an innate, nobody told her. And until that age, let's say maybe four or five, it was, it was fine for her to run around without being completely dressed. And then all of a sudden she doesn't want to. She wants her privacy. So it's a natural instinct, not a religious uh, obligation. 
<clears throat> on the contrary, the violation of privacy or the violation of modesty is unnatural. That's why it's a sin. It's a violation. It's a form of abuse. So the media that uses women's bodies to sell products and to uh, overstimulate the population. <laughs> this one guy, I think what he said was brilliant. He said somebody stopped him in the street and said, we're doing a survey. Would you mind answering a few questions? He said, sure. Anyway, they asked him, how many times a day do you think of sex? He says, I don't know. They said, take a guess. He says, I can't. I don't know how many times a day I think of sex. I know that if you keep asking me about it, <laughs> you're introducing the subject, not me. Yeah. So every advertisement, every billboard, every, every, you're constantly intruding on my privacy mm -hmm. with your sexual messages. So if I was left alone natural, I have no idea how I would think of sex. Because mm -hmm. you don't leave me, you don't leave me alone. <laughs> so we've distorted our sexual nature completely. I, I think that's what's, uh, what I was trying to say earlier is what is most interesting because it can seem like you're just putting, not you, but anyone is just putting themselves in a box. But it actually, like with the different stories that you shared in here and like the, um, how you were sharing it towards the end, I think there was, the read an article and there was a, a, a yeshiva boy um, who was asked like why he do, doesn't take, touch, um, you know, girls, but it, he, he was like, no, my friends are the, the ones that are missing out. Just a, t just a touch of a finger, um, I'm, uh, I don't know the words, but you know, he's so um, encapsulated just by a touch. People are very confused about this. I know a guy, his wife was very, very upset with him. Now, they're both very liberal, and they both admit to having had affairs while married, and they're okay with that. But his wife wanted a divorce. She was so upset because she had been away for a weekend, and she came back, and there was evidence that her husband had a woman in the house while she was gone. What bothered her the most is you let her wear my robe? <laughs> what? She just couldn't get over it. My robe? Yeah. Oh, that was a violation of privacy. <laughs> my robe, that's, that's intimate territory. How could somebody else be wearing my robe? It's so, it's so disturbed. The robe is more intimate and therefore more, you will be okay. So what is the violation? Where is the violation? Obviously being raped is a huge violation, but it doesn't begin there. A person violating your privacy simply by looking through your window? That's a violation. The more, the more, uh, the more sensitive, the more insightful, the more mature a person is, the more modesty he requires. And the more easily he is offended or traumatized by, by an intrusion mm -hmm. into that privacy. Like, for example, you read, you read my mail? 
Not that there's anything in the mail that nobody should know. I've got no secrets. But you went and read my mail? Where's modesty? See, so modesty has a very a very large application. It's not just uh, get dressed. Mm -hmm. So the more we preserve of ourselves and not put it on display and not dissipate it into the air, into the public, you know, like everybody knows the girl who flirts with everybody doesn't love anybody. With with how technology and everything is moving and you know, a lot of data is and information is readily uh, available. Um, there are some people that will almost kind of react like, well, I don't want to share any of my stuff, um, which if I'm kind of hearing that, it kind of feels like, okay, what are you hiding? But on the same t point, um, hearing your me and reading your message, it kind of now, I felt like I was one to be like, well, I don't have anything to hide. So, you know, what will I, <laughs> what could really happen? Like, so, but, so how, how can one on an individual basis really uh, begin to, to, to build that for themselves first? Because before the relationship, this is, this is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. There is there is your internal private life and there is your social life. Mm -hmm. We have taken almost every part of our private lives and turned them social, especially with the internet. What we need to do is the opposite. Preserve as much of your private life as you can. Keep it internal. Keep it deep. Share it cautiously, thoughtfully, and permanently. Don't run in and out of relationships. Now, there's a very scary statistic. I think the Pew, the Pew statistic, whatever. The average couple in the United States are intimate or have sex at best once a month. Once a month. That, that is a tragedy. And if they miss that one day, then it's once in two months. And they're okay with it. Because, you know, they're tired, they both work, they're yeah. busy, they're distracted, they've got anxieties, tension, and they just don't have the energy for intimacy. Now, wait a minute. These are people who sleep in the same bed every night. And every night they ignore each other. It, Is something wrong with this picture? What's causing this? Where is society becomes extinct? You simply lose interest in sex. You're certainly lost interest in reproduction. So you're just going to die out. Nobody has to kill you. You're yeah. just going to disappear. So Judaism, the Torah, does not demand modesty in order to limit your sexual activity. On the contrary, once a month, that's terrible. <laughs> But when you dissipate, when you kiss everybody hello, when you hug everybody and anybody, when you talk about intimacy casually as if it's some kind of, uh, as some kind of um, Olympic event, uh, I don't know, a major performance, and when every article and every magazine tells you how to have better sex, more sex, greater sex, Secrets to better sex. People are just losing interest in the whole thing. You're killing off sexuality. And the solution to that is 
let sex die, replace it with intimacy. And there's a difference between sex and intimacy. Sex is a performance. It's a thing. You had any sex? Are you good at it? It's a thing. It's an it. Intimacy means just us. Mm. Us. With no, with no barriers. Borders, but no barriers. And in order to do that, this is part of the book, in order to have no barriers, you need borders. Interesting. Because without the borders, it's too dangerous to not create barriers. So when you have no borders, you put up barriers to protect yourself. Or in different words, when can you be spontaneous? When there are no borders? No, then it's too dangerous. That's going to be what? Chaotic? chaotic? If there are no borders and you allow yourself to be spontaneous, you're actually being reckless. Interesting. And the excitement is the danger, the risk element. It's not intimacy. When the borders are in place, when you know what's right and what's wrong and what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, who is appropriate, who is not appropriate, all those borders are there. Now you can just relax and be spontaneous because you're safe. So it's kind of, it kind of, I, I feel like it's similar to either like a piece of music or a sport. You're creating really guidelines and boundary borders so that you don't even you don't you don't have to think about how should I be right now it's like you have it well defined that oh I'm here it's just not this is how I naturally am but so like like the ten commandments yeah God comes and says here are ten commandments imagine people saying don't tell me what to do yeah. I'll make my own commandments. God is saying, look, murder is not a good idea. Stealing is not a good idea. Idolatry is not a good idea. You know, dissing your mother is not a good idea. So why don't we put those things to rest? Don't think about it ever. Murder is out. Stealing is out. You honor your mother. Now, Go out and get a life. But if you have to ponder the question, is murder okay? Sometimes, can I kill him a little? <laughs> can I kill him later? Is it okay to steal something, sometime from people, from government? From... You spend your whole life trying to figure out Ten Commandments. And by the time you figure it out, you're too old to accomplish anything. So God says, let me give you a head start. Here are the borders. Now relax and get a life. It's, it's interesting. How, how would, um, in the context of how we can, we are, we have free choice and we can choose in a sense how we feel in, in every situation, how does it do, uh, um, correspond with that? We want to put our free choice to good use. Mm -hmm. If we have to ponder the question of to murder or not to murder, that's not a good use of our freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. Because after you've studied the subject for years, you may come to the conclusion that murder is wrong. So what have you accomplished? So now you're not going to kill. I could have told you that 10 years ago, and you would not have to waste time on that. So we want to put our free choice to good use. So we ask God, give us the parameters, tell us the rules of the game, and then we will use our free choice to play the game well. But don't make me make up the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. I'm not the creator.
So tell us what you want us to make of this world and then we'll, we'll go about it. Yeah. Knowing where we're headed, knowing that that's the purpose, knowing that that's the goal, we'll use our free choice well. But when the free choice is to kill or not to kill, you're living in the gutter. So waste of free choice. Yeah. So I wrote another book. It's called The Joy of Intimacy. Just a year ago. And the book, the purpose for that book is I hear from married women who are happily married, really no complaints against the husband. Her problem is that in a quiet moment, she feels that she is alone in the world. Horrible feeling. Feeling alone in the world is actually a health problem. Because when you get that feeling, your whole immune system crashes. Yeah. You give up on life. And then you're vulnerable to every disease. So that feeling of being kept on making sure COVID stays away. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that feeling of being alone should disappear the moment you get married. At the very least, this is what marriage does. You're never alone again. And even if you're separated from your, from your husband or from your wife, yeah. even if you're separated by a large ocean, you're not alone. Somebody on the other side of the ocean is your other, your other part, your other half, who can't live without you or doesn't want to live without you. But if you're married and happily married and still feel alone, what in the world is going on? Not an, it's not a personal problem, or not problem, but it's not a personal thing? No? So if you look in the Torah, it says, therefore should a man leave his mother and father, cleave to his wife, and become one. The only relationship in which you become one and you stop being alone is a marriage. You have to leave your mother and father. Why can't you be one with them? <laughs> You're not alone. You have a mother and a father. Thank God. Yeah, but you're still alone. Because to your mother and father, you are number three, not number one. How did you know I'm the third born? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Even if you're the first born, you're yeah, I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, the purpose of marriage is to become one, to stop being alone. So, what's the problem? Why is marriage not producing that these days? So, here's a quick analysis. If I say to a woman, "I love you for your money." And I want to marry you for your money. Everybody in the world would be critical of me. Yeah. And say that that's, that's offensive. Why is it offensive? She has money. <laughs> a lot of money. And I like money. Isn't that a perfect shiva? Depends on maybe where she earned the money from. Well, uh, assuming that it's legal. Yeah. She has what I want. So what's wrong with that? So people say, well, what's going to happen if she loses the money? I'll take a risk, okay? <laughs> that's, that's the objection? What if she loses the money? Have you met people that are, have actually married the other for their money? Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, they call it financial stability. 
Doesn't that sound much better? <laughs> they married for the financial stability. Now, but here's the point. If I say I love you for your money, what I'm really saying is I love your money. I don't love you. When I say I want to marry you for your money, I'm not saying I want to marry you with your money. I'm saying I want your money. Unfortunately, you come with it, so I have to marry you. So when I say I want to marry you for your money, what I'm really saying is, can you just give me the money? Why does everything have to be so complicated? Yeah. I have to marry you for the money? All right, if that's the only way to do it, so I'll do it. Now, this is so offensive. It is so, it is so insulting and degrading of the human being. I'll put up with you for your money. You know what it's like? It's like saying to God, I will serve you and I will worship you to get to heaven. You know, really what it's I'm saying your, is... It's on your own. It's all based on your own, not only ideas of what the other person is, but your own wishes and desires. So a lot of that would, I would think, would come from, you know, some kind of... Um, I don't want to call it a psychological issue because a lot of, we all have different um, behaviors we adopted. Um, but, you know, like the money thing, it could be more of like, that wouldn't be the core problem. It would be more of like a, well, maybe that person grew up not having money. So it's more of like a safety thing. Right. So how does one, how, how does one first get out of their own way so that they can look at this other person and actually love who they are. How do I, how do I as, as we slowly start to, to, to close up this wonderful conversation, how do I begin to think and ask myself or for anyone listening, define borders for myself, or if I'm in a relationship right now, not necessarily an orthodox relationship, but we want to have more intimacy, what are some things that we can consider? In order to have more intimacy, you have to get all things out of the way. Yeah. You have to get money out of the way. But here's the shocker. You have to get love out of the way. Mm. Love is the thing. So if I say, instead of saying, I want to marry you for your money, I say, I want to marry you for your love just as bad, just as bad. Really? Because when I say I want to marry you for, for the love, I'm saying, just give me the love. Keep the rest. I'm not interested in the rest. Just the love, please. Not your opinion, <laughs> not your moods, not your personality. I'm not marrying any of that. Mm -hmm. I'm only marrying your love. And you're ruining it by having an opinion. <laughs> so just shut up and accept my love. It's terrible. And our grandparents didn't have that problem. They didn't marry love that came with a person. They married a person who brought love. But here's the problem. What do I need? If I don't need anything, I'll get married. The problem is we haven't yet convinced ourselves that we need someone. Yeah. We think we need something. If it's not money, it's love. Or sex. Yeah. How many people believe that marriage is basically love and sex? but not a person. So I don't need you in my life. What do I need you for? Unless you give me something. 
That's not a marriage. Marriage means I want you, not what I can get from you. So a man says, I love Apologize for anyone listening as the audio kind of cut out. Rabbi, I can't seem to hear you. I don't hear you. Can you hear me now? Now I do. All right, perfect. Right? So the guy says, I love everything about my wife, but my wife wants a divorce. You love everything about your wife. Yeah, but not her. You just don't need her. Naturally, she feels alone in the world. Yeah. So, how do we fix it? Get things out of the way. So it's a it's really a perspective shift, huh? Oh yeah. So how did? So that's I I would think is more on an individual basis. How do you drive that, or how does one practice? Uh, how did you practice and really? you know, foster this, the ability to, the, like I said, the word choice. It's not, you know, I don't, I, I am not a, uh, a, a, a coach. A coach is a role that I play. I am not a, you know, that it's, it's kind of, it's the whole identity thing that now is, is brought towards relationships. So how can somebody really, um, begin to cultivate that because maybe for the majority of their life, you know, what do you mean? I'm identified as uh, an athlete. I'm identified as a student. How do I now become identified as a husband? Well, how, well, how do I also not identify as, as, a, as a husband, but identify as well, I am a piece of God, and one of those roles that I play is, is being husband. And what does it mean to be a husband? I don't know. I'm not there yet. Mm -hmm. But I'd but like to, you know, should I? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> here's practical advice. Don't confuse sex with intimacy. Yeah. A couple were intimate, and afterwards the husband says, so how was it? How was it? That means you did not experience intimacy. It was a performance. You were busy with your own awareness, with your own pleasure. You have no idea what was going on with the other person. And you have to check. You have to ask as if you were not there because you weren't there. You were absent. So don't confuse sex with intimacy. Sex used to be intimate, but we changed that. We took all the intimacy out of it. We made it pornography, basically. Mm. So if you introduce things into an intimate relationship, that's pornography. So here's a practical, uh, common sense solution. Never be intimate with the lights on. Never. That's pornography. Pornography introduced sex with the lights on because, you know, the camera needs light. Intimacy is never visible. So if you're trying to be intimate, you should not be seeing anything because anything you see is a thing. You got to keep things away from your intimacy. So the bedroom should not have things that don't belong, like a television, a computer, a desk. There's no. even a study that shows that uh, if there's a television in the room, it, um, it hinders sexual activity. Yes. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. So here's how you achieve intimacy. The, the room should be dark so that you see nothing. Not even your partner. Not even your partner, because what you're going to see is just the freckle. 
you're not going to see your partner. You're going to be, you're going to see something about your partner. But there's, well, go ahead. I didn't, go ahead. And seeing things kills intimacy. It turns it into pornography. Hmm. Um, secondly, there should be no sound, no music playing, no television on. You should hear nothing. Hmm. And there's no talking. There's no talking. It's such a distraction. Even if you're saying things about your experience, words are inappropriate. So you see nothing, you hear nothing, and you say nothing. Now, where is your attention going to go? To the person. Yeah. Now you have a chance of being intimate. It's very interesting. One more radical thought. Yeah. No, I, I just wanted to kind of point out, I, I love the you're you're really breaking down the different parts of it and really you know expressing how what this part of you, you know the whole thing of the re sexual relationship is because you know you, all of that under the umbrella term of sex is part of sex like even if the lights are on and all this other kind of stuff but you're breaking it down to really well what's the intimate part what is the really intimate part because you could it's so i don't know if it's easy but you could say it's like easy to miss uh understand well were you intimate was i having an intimate time or was i just having sex mm -hmm. there are a few differences one is sex leaves you feeling alone. It doesn't bond you. Number two, sex leaves you feeling a little reduced. You've lost a little respect for yourself and for the person you're with. Hmm. It's kind of embarrassing, especially since it's a performance. More innocent than before because the ability to connect to another person comes from your innocent self, where you're not greedy, you're not performing, you're not egotistical, you're not thinking about yourself. So here's the other radical idea. What is this crazy notion of sleeping in one bed? It's, it's horrible. I think if you're going to be intimate, you should show at least a little initiative. At least get up and go to her bed. Show a little interest. Don't just roll over. So sleeping in the same bed has turned sex into such a boring activity. In addition to which, there is something very insulting and off-putting you get into the same bed and you just want to sleep? Well, thank you very much. What do you mean there's cuddling? Yeah. Wait, we are against cuddling? No, it's just a good theory. It never happens. <laughs> I'll let you know when I'm there. <laughs> Eventually, it, it, it gets boring too. And just, just leave me alone. So it's so insulting to be sleeping next to each other and showing no interest. I just want to sleep. Mm -hmm. Fight over the blanket. That's called overly familiar. And that's the familiarity that breeds contempt. You get turned off to each other. See, that's why in a, in a synagogue, you're not allowed to daven. You're not allowed to pray next to your wife. Yeah. You know why? Perhaps. Not because she will distract you from God. No. Like Halavai. <laughs> if only. It's the opposite. 
God says, do not speak to me when your wife is present. Don't ignore her. That's callous. God prefers that you be distracted by your wife because <laughs> that's not happening anymore. So if you can be in the same bed and you don't even notice her, what is that going to do to the relationship? It is so much more romantic when you think about it. You know, the kings, yeah. his bedroom and her bedroom. That's an excellent uh, hey, there's something point. I was always curious. I was always curious when I, when, uh, when I was in Germany last summer and we got to go to the um, New Schwanstein Castle and the, they did have different bedrooms. And it, would, it was curious, I was curious, like why, why would you wanna be in a separate room? And you're saying bed, like growing up and even now, like I would want to have the same room so, but so like your these it's ideas like that you shared, it is really interesting, and yeah. it, you know the whole idea, kind of what we've been speaking about on your book is how it actually enhances the relationship, is uh, an, an awesome perspective. Yeah, the kings. It's not like they couldn't afford a bigger bedroom, <laughs> <laughs> but the romance, the power. He knocks on her door. This man is serious. <laughs> we can just roll over as long as we're in bed together anyway. We might as well have some sex. I mean, that's disgusting. So it turns out that Jewish tradition is so ahead of its time. Is there a Jewish book like the Kama Sutra? No. No? No, because intimacy is not a subject, it's life. But is it, is it, are we completely, uh, for lack of a better word, against the, 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 let's say, fun, not, nah, that's a bad word, but, uh, or uh, not the right kind of word, um, but, you know, experimenting with different ways to, to bring more intimacy, to have more intimacy. Yeah, but you see, all those experiments have already been tried. Really? And the results are in. The results are, it's supposed to be intimate. Intimate means face to face. Don't turn your back on your spouse. Hmm. That may be enjoyable, it's not intimate. Yeah. So it's, it's a beautiful system. It's a beautiful um, understanding of human nature. I, um, I, I, th I think I've mentioned it a few times, but um, I think that's what really caught my attention the most is that it actually enhances it. And this modesty as, modesty as like a border for intimacy, you know, it's like you're, like you shared, it's providing kind of a space for you to be, you know, you in every, wherever you are, your, your real you. And, um, you know, I really appreciate speaking with you. And I think that's the best way how it really ties in together with, um, you know, what I'm passionate about, what I'm really trying to get with in this podcast, because I feel like, you know, talk, if somebody were listening, maybe it might not apply, but, um, it's been great. I'm, I'd, I'd love to know, to, to finish out, uh, Rabbi, how, in addition to like learning from the Torah and studying Hasidus and different things, how did you really learn to develop these insights about living modestly and pra pra practicing it with your wife, as well as main, being able to um, keep it, let's say, achieving a, it's just greater levels of intimacy over ho however many years you've been married? It's a result of all the conversations mm -hmm. with all the women, thousands of women, over the years, 
where it became very apparent sex is not a solution. Love is not the end goal. In the 60s, we tried that. Just make love. Yeah. It was a for marriage. So we had to present on, a, on an adult level the Jewish concept of modesty. Husband and wife are modest with each other. You don't lower your standards with your spouse. You give them as much dignity as you give the pizza delivery guy. You would never answer the door in your underwear. Why do you run around with your spouse? And, you know? So there's a certain dignity, there's a certain nobility, there's a certain beauty to how you conduct an intimate relationship. You can't just, you can't just be neglected and hope that it's going to work. There's wisdom to it. Like somebody once said, you don't tell me how to have sex. I don't need your, you know, Torah can't tell me how the guy says, I don't need to be told how to have sex. You're right. Sex doesn't take any, in, in, any wisdom, any insight. Birds and bees do it. You can do it too. But if you want intimacy, you need a little wisdom. Wow. Awesome. Well, Rabbi, it's, uh, I have much more to ask and to, to converse with you about, um, but I look up and the time has already been close to an hour. So thank you very much for taking the time and being on the show. It's really a pleasure and a privilege because these ideas can literally save lives. Yeah. The pain and the frustration in a marriage that isn't working, terrible, terribly painful. So thank you for your service.